Welcome to The Road to Innovation, powered by the Kleinert Foundation. On each episode, we delve into innovative solutions to society's most pressing issues like sex trafficking, homelessness, and poverty. We hope that with each conversation, you'll be inspired to take actionable steps towards social change. Here's your host, Hannah Rabelais from the Kleinert Foundation. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Road to Innovation podcast powered by the Kleiner Foundation. Today, we have a very special guest and one of my favorite people in Dallas, the one and only Miss Sarah Burns, Chief Marketing Officer at Dallas Children's Advocacy Center. Sarah, welcome to the show, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I so love good. being asked to do this. Yes, it's so good to see your face. I think we've, I've forgotten how much I've enjoyed just seeing people periodically. Like we're just right. not having events or do anything in person anymore. I'm like, oh, like I wouldn't see you that often, but I'm like, I just miss yeah. your presence. So I'm just so glad we're able to do this. Um, right. So for our listeners who don't know about you or even Dallas Children's Advocacy Center, um, can you just share a little bit about yourself and your background before you became Chief Marketing Officer at DCAC? Sure. So, um, I don't know how far you want me to go back, but Whatever you um, feel. <laughs> I am married to my husband, John. We've been almost 15 years and we have an almost 11 year old Mac. Oh. So they're my world. And then I grew up in Grapevine, Texas, um, as in a relatively large family, four siblings or three siblings, four of us. And then my father is a a Baptist minister, so grew up um, really um, with a servant servant's heart, raised that way, always giving back, um, and then got interested in marketing, PR, really kind of watching my dad's career and his leadership roles uh, in churches, just seeing how there could be misunderstandings versus mis because of miscommunication or how um, certain initiatives in in the church could have been maybe more successful with more awareness or a little bit of a push. And so this will date me, but I grew up in a time when women did not become preachers. And so I became a marketer, which to me is essentially the same thing. You're just evangelizing about a brand or um, in my case, a cause. So um, even now, this will still date me. There was no social impact type college degrees, which is, I wish I'd been around for that. Um, so I went in the PR marketing, uh, lane and, um, have worked in the nonprofit sector my entire career, actually. So that's kind of how I got to where I am. And I've been at Dallas Children's Advocacy Center for three years now. And um, children's advocacy centers, prior to me being recruited to that role, I actually didn't know very much about them. Um, There's a lot of confusion with CASA, which is court appointed special, I'm going to say it wrong because I don't know, but they're volunteer advocates for children in the foster care system. Children's advocacy centers um, work with, in a lot of areas, work with all types of child abuse and neglect cases here in Dallas County because of the volume of cases. We work with um, the cases that rise to the level of of a criminal offense. Um, So there will likely be criminal charges against the alleged perpetrator. And um, what's unique unique about Children's Advocacy Centers is it's a co-location model. So in Dallas County, we have um, MOUs, and protocols with all law enforcement jurisdictions in Dallas County, but inside our building is the Child Abuse Unit of Dallas Police Department, and then uh, about seven units of DFPS or CPS, and those are their special investigators. And so um, along with those investigators, plus our staff, which includes forensic interviewers who interview the child to get their story, Our family advocates who are social workers, um, they provide um, guidance along the journey from the first day at DCAC all the way to court. And then our clinicians, um, along with our staff and those investigators, um, we're co-located so that the family only has to come to one location for all of their services. 
Um, and additionally, we're able to quickly coordinate cases um, so that children get the services that they need and deserve, um, so that they get justice, so that they re receive healing, um, and to give them hope as well. Wonderful. Um, so let's talk about, um, so COVID-19 has affected nonprofits in a variety of different ways. And I think a lot of people feel like, okay, everything is closed down, like, you know, retail, malls, all that. But what y'all are doing does not stop. And unfortunately, yeah. you know, there, I've seen a couple different things that child abuse cases are on the rise because people are stuck at home with their abusers and their family. Um, and so it's not, home is not a safe place um, for a lot of kids in our community. Um, and I saw like on when you posted on Instagram, just at maybe today or so, um, that y'all had 150 plus um, forensic interviews conducted during COVID-19 pandemic. Right. So y'all's work has not stopped. Um, so can you just talk about how y'all have had to pivot? Because I know not everyone is going into your office probably. So how does that look like now that we're kind of in, in the yeah. middle of this pandemic? So our work has not stopped. And actually, even in normal operating times, we are kind of 24-7. If there's, you know, a case in the middle of the night, we come in. Um, our on-call staff comes in. So um, the way we're delivering our services has changed a little bit. Um, for clients coming in um, for a forensic interview, and that can be, comes through a couple of different ways. Is one, it could be a very emergency situation. Um, so maybe um, a hostage situation or um, something similar that's in the middle of the night. So that's immediate. Um, we get called in for that. There's also um, very high priority cases where the child may be in danger if they return home or return um, to where their alleged perpetrator is. So those are those are being seen. And then sometimes there's uh, scheduled interviews. So maybe those are cases where um, there's been a disclosure of abuse but the alleged perpetrator doesn't live in the area. And um, so it's not as they're not, the child's not in immediate danger. So um, what we have done during this time is those um, scheduled interviews, we were not seeing as many per day. Currently, we're seeing about eight scheduled interviews a day. Normally we see about 12, I would say. And then on the, then nothing has changed for those emergency cases. We're still um, seeing those as they come in. What, what is down and is kind of confusing is reports of child abuse. So part of our team actually reads every report made to DFPS on child abuse and then helps coordinate those cases. So not only is DFPS reading the cases and sometimes law enforcement, depending on how it's reported, but also our MDT coordinators. And MDT is our multidisciplinary team. And these are um, the investigators and DCAC staff that work together on these cases. Our MDT coordinators read a case as it comes in and um, is able to kind of research potential background um, and maybe flag cases that um, are more urgent than others. I mean, you kind of feel bad saying about that because they're all urgent. Um, but um, so that way we're able to help law enforcement and DFPS, DFPS to make sure that no child falls through the cracks. Um, we don't want to miss a case um, just because our services are so vital, um, especially what we know about the long-term effects of trauma and especially child abuse. So for um, those emergent, emergencies, forensic interviews, those have not really changed that much. Um, and then at, after that initial interview, you know, we provide all of these healing services for our clients and their non-offending family members. So where we've um, changed in that regard is we were able to get up and running actually thanks to a, um, a donation from uh, the Trey Carlock Fund. Um, oh, wow, awesome to set up our telehealth. So we're using a service called doxy.me. And so currently most all of our therapy sessions 
and any you know check-ins with families with our family advocates that's being conducted via telehealth so yeah, we're incredible. yeah we're half we're half in the building and kind of half not um but uh we are seeing or hearing less reports of child abuse but i think that's just because kids aren't in school with mm you know, they're in their homes. And unfortunately, a lot of child abuse actually happens in the home um, by someone the child knows and trusts. So mm -hmm. currently, I think similar to domestic violence, we're super concerned that there's a lot of abuse happening behind closed doors. Abuse thrives in secrecy. Um, so what may, you know, what we don't know is going on, we'll find out in, in a few weeks and a few months and a few days yeah who knows um, at this point who yeah. knows at this point mm -hmm. but um we will be there and be ready for it well i'm just Whatever so grateful that. for your staff because the tele yeah. you know the telehealth the counseling sessions are probably a lot of families lifeline at this moment i just cannot yeah. imagine especially when you're fresh out of you know if you're a child who just recently reported the abuse and is just mm -hmm. starting this process i cannot imagine being you know potentially stuck in the home where the abuse happened and so i'm just so yes. grateful that your staff did this quickly i'm so glad that you were able to get a grant to be able to make this happen because this yeah. is saving people's lives potentially. Um, yeah, I just cannot imagine being stuck yeah. at home during this time, just dealing with that emotional trauma on top of the, all the abuse that had happened to that child. Um, yes, so. and, the, and too, a lot of our families are facing other types of um, hardships, you know, financial or, you know, in a lot of cases, the alleged perpetrator might be the breadwinner in mm. the family. And if, you know, that person's in jail or you know not in the home anymore um you know that makes it hard and a lot of people are losing jobs so um it's a very stressful time for all of us um and then just added stress to yes. a lot of our families yeah i cannot imagine being the chief marketing officer during this time right now especially when you're talking about child abuse but just general just um COVID 19 like it is so hard to even um because we do some social media on the Kleiner foundation i'm like i don't know what words how, what do you even say how do you even talk about this yeah um so how has your role kind of evolved and changed and can you kind of just give us some tips or things that you've been yeah. thinking about from a marketing perspective because i know so many people who are probably listening are like how do i even navigate this right now talking yeah. to the public i mean i will not lie i think i my heart goes out to a lot of my fellow colleagues or communicators or marketers in their in any industry um this is not really um even with business continuity plans and crisis communication plans because everything's changing sometimes you know we would make decisions at 9 a.m in the morning and i would begin to draft communications to get those out um because we have about 250 people that work in our building um plus the community plus a board um lots of people to talk to. Um, we would make decisions at 9 a.m. and I would have something ready to go and then we'd get a report on the news or you know a press um, a presser from the county or the state or the federal government, which you know kind of changes things. Um, so it's been very busy, um, which I think people that work in roles sim similar to mine, they kind of thrive on that, the busyness and being able able to pivot, um, I'm sure there are things that have gone out with uh, typos <laughs> or errors, um, but it's been really important and key for us to be um, honest and communicate often um, and be transparent about what's going on. We act, we have not we're not going to play like everything's fine for us out in the community or anywhere because it's not a lot of nonprofits um, had to cancel fundraising events us included um, so then my role also helps support the fundraising efforts so including event production and promoting those events um, you know we had content for like social and digital pre-built for during this time because we were supposed to we have a awareness campaign in the market called Save Jane, 
and that was supposed to be running during this time and it didn't seem appropriate. So we mm. held on that. So everything that we had pre-built, we're kind of coming up with it day by day, um, which is not ideal for us. Um, kind of like to be maybe one or two steps ahead. Yeah. So, you know, we've taken that a little bit back and, um, luckily I have a great team that I work with and, um, a great, amazing marketing specialist, Son Sonia Nideri, who, um, is so, uh, positive and willing to try anything. Um, she comes up with ideas. I come up with ideas and, you know, we try and put it out there and see what sticks. Yeah. So it has, it has been challenging. It's, I've learned a lot. I think everybody's learning a lot. Um, I've learned so much more about, I think, what people really value, but maybe mm. um, maybe they haven't been able to express that or even focus on that because our world is so busy. Um, yes. We're seeing a lot of people become more intentional um, with how they spend their time. Um, and so there's been actually more conversations going on because of this. Maybe not necessarily because people have more time, but they're consuming media more. Yes. Um, so we've been able to connect with uh, new people. And that's also through the community as well, because there's been a lot of fundraisers uh, that have been started by others on our behalf um, without our initiation um, that have been have spread awareness, have raised funds. So that's really been fun to watch, too. On the, on the positive side of all of this and things that we're learning. So it's yeah. been interesting. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. Busy. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because you brought up like, yeah, as a marketer, you have to be two steps ahead, but COVID-19 is like 10 steps ahead of all of us. Yeah. And like every minute it changes. So it's yeah. kind of hard to land at one place or even just try to message it because yeah, you might post something and then three hour, hours later it changes or it's different or that's not yeah. the whole fact. Yeah, it's- Or ooh. it's just, you know, everyone's doing- learning how to do business differently. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, that kind of tells you something about the human spirit as well. Um, you know, we don't give up. So try, yeah. you know, everyone's trying different things and um, also trying to move really quickly. So I'm learning, I mean, I'm learning as much from others as I hope they may be learning from us. Uh, it's, you know, I look across um, things that I media I consume and I'm like, dang it, why didn't I think of that? Or, you know, we thought of that, but we didn't get it executed <laughs> quick enough. Yeah. Um, so it's been interesting to see um, the human spirit and our resiliency um, and how we fight for the things that we believe in. And, mm. um, you know, that's what we do at DCAC. So yeah. it'll, it aligns pretty well. Yes. Do you have any like resources, articles, blogs that could be helpful to other marketing professionals during this time that you've kind of leaned on or things that, you know, other things that you have learned during this time? Yeah. So I, so from a true marketing communications perspective, I read a lot of, you know, things that come out of the consumer marketing world and really look, um, you know, businesses that have large marketing and advertising budgets and are trying new things, testing new products and strategies. Um, I kind of try to watch them and then see how I can mirror that in the nonprofit sector, because oftentimes we're working on scrappy budgets, if a budget at all. Um, and, you know, just working with a lot less resources. So I kind of watch this. So I've been reading a lot of consumer insights. So things that come out of um, Ad Age and um, an agent, we work with the Richards Group on our awareness campaign. They're so kind to send me some of the consumer insights that they're seeing. And then I read also Harvard Business Review, which is um, kind of a snoozer if you're not an Academician, but there's so many great learnings in there and just understanding how business works and how it's how to pivot um, because marketing communications is a support service mm -hmm. to the to the true business. Um, and so just understanding um, 
learnings and findings and how I can take from those and apply it in the nonprofit, sec nonprofit sector. Um, I also really like Gail Perry. She runs a blog and a consulting service called Fired Up Fundraising. Um, she has a little bit of um, irreverency, which I really connect with. Um, and she's kind of, kind of tell it like it is type person. Uh, mm. She gives great uh, guidance and step-by-step -step advice. Um, and then also just any kind of webinars that have been running, you know, I'll, there's so much free um, learnings and webinars going on during this time. So I try and sign up for as much as I can and then maybe skim through it. Some of it I already know, we've already tried. Um, some of it, you know, just learning from other organizations that are larger than us um, and seeing what they're doing and even organizations that are smaller than us that, you know, are thinking outside of the box and again, using the resources that they have super creatively to still achieve their goals. Um, and then I think my other is just my peer group of similar colleagues. So I still keep in touch with college professors um, that I had in school. Um, I have lots of friends that work in similar roles, um, other friends that are even volunteer fundraisers. So lots of conversations mm -hmm. about, you know, what are, what are you hearing as a board member at the organizations yeah. that you serve or, you know, uh, friends that are chairing fundraising events. What are you hearing? What are y'all considering? Um, and just kind of, you know, share the wealth, share the knowledge. Um, we have such great minds and uh, talented, creative people um, in a community that's so generous. Um, so I really like the collaboration and hearing from others and, you know, sharing with them what we're seeing, what's working, what's not, um, and just kind of learning off of that. Yeah, I think that's the one inspiring thing of this whole situation is seeing people collaborate and talking to each other and sharing resources. It's we realize it's like we all are needing the same things right now. We're needing funding. Right. We're needing the support. We're needing to raise awareness about our organizations and what y'all are doing right now. So I just am so inspired to hear that you are like, yeah, our colleagues are leaning on each other. They're, we're kind of breaking down these, uh, you know, competitive barriers. It's like, yeah. okay, we all are in this together and if we're going to survive yeah. and our community's going to survive and we're going to keep the health of the people that we serve, you know, up we need each other. Yes. And I just, so that makes me, my heart so happy to hear yes. that. So, oh, yeah. And you so don't good. often see that, especially on the fundraising side. No. Um, mm -hmm. People are very or competitive with each other, you know, trying to raise more money through different events, um, which is fun. But on the programmatic side, what we do is so collaborative with other agencies yeah. like law enforcement, like CPS, like traffic 911, new friends, new life, um, CASA. Um, it takes all of the experts and what they're experts at mm -hmm. to achieve our goals. And it's for the betterment of our community. Um, I yes. was personally super, uh, excited to see a lot of the funders in the community, like communities foundation, United way, Dallas Cowboys, um, lots of other um, funders pulling together, creating the North Texas CARES uh, grant cycle, um, as well as the uh, North Texas Giving Tuesday Now. Yes. Make sure I say that right. right. <laughs> um, that, was, that was really um, inspiring to see that because um, used to, and we're seeing it more now, but used to you didn't see collaborative funding. Mm -hmm. um, but seeing all of those funders come together um, to really meet the needs of our community because there are so many yes. during this time. I mean, it could be hard to choose if you only have so much to give. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been, you know, that's been leadership for us too to see yeah. other organizations collaborate. I want to talk about, so where did y'all get the idea for your virtual pinwheel scavenger hunt? I thought that was so innovative and cool. And I just, um, I love the bright colors. Like I just like saw it like yeah. just on social media, seeing in people's windows. And it was so inspiring. Yeah. I just, where did you get that idea? I just love that. So that idea that. actually came out uh, from one of our staff members, um, Leela. She's an annual giving development officer. And um, 
early on during this time, I think we're kind of seeing less of it. Maybe there's a little bit of fatigue. Um, early on during this time, we were seeing lots of people looking for creative ways to connect, to interact in their neighborhood. Um, at the beginning of shelter in place, I don't know if you recall, it was so rainy here in Dallas. It rained for like it fit the mood of what was 40 happening. Forty days yeah. or however long <laughs> Noah was on the ark. Uh, right. Um, <laughs> it rained forever, and people were itching to get out of their homes. And um, so we've actually, you know, similar to the Penwell scavenger hunt, been able to participate in a lot of things like um, the front porch photography. So we're um professional photographers are they'll come to your home and take a family portrait of you on your front porch and give a portion of the proceeds um so it kind of came out of during that just thinking of ideas and how we could um connect people to our mission how we can um involve kids in our mission a lot of times people think this is something scary and it happens to other kids but what we actually know um, is that a lot of disclosures actually happen on the playground to, you know, a child telling a trusted friend something um, and that trusted friend actually encouraging them to talk to a safe adult or maybe even sharing with the safe adult. Um, so it is important that we educate our kids um, about child abuse, about how to stay safe and have boundaries and relationships and all of that. So. Um, that was Leela's idea, the Pinwell Scavenger Hunt. So it's been fun to promote and fun to see your own town. Um, it was so innovative. Yeah. yeah, it was so great. Yeah, just so completely different. Yeah, yeah. It was so in but it was uplifting at the same time. Yes. And yeah, and you can do it with your kids and um, mm -hmm. all that, all that good stuff. So, yeah, yeah so that was fun. Love that. Nice to do that. Um, so we have to wrap up soon. I, this con I, we have so many other questions yeah, I wanted so to get to. I know. But um, so how can people get involved during this time of social distancing for DCAC? I know it's kind of you're not having your probably your regular volunteer opportunities. What are some sure. ways that our listeners can help you in DCAC? You know, just like everyone else, we're st it's still the same things that we tell everyone all the time, but we're just doing it a little bit different. We want people to get educated to understand how to recognize and report child abuse, but also how to keep their safe, uh, keep their kids safe in the real and the digital world. Kids are online a lot more these days. So we've made those training, we have trainings on that. They're available online. Usually we do them in person, but they're for free online. So we want people to get educated. We want them to get involved. So. Um, whatever that might mean to them. So maybe it's similar to the Kids Save Dallas initiative where um, they were raising, you know, friends of DCAC were raising dollars um, for restaurants that they spent on restaurant gift cards and then donated those gift cards to DCAC. So we've helped our families with those. So um, get involved. Um, you know, maybe you want to do the Pendle Scavenger Hunt. We have tons of ideas on our website and social media. Um, we also have a family auxiliary called the Save Jane Society, and it's a, um, a way to keep families involved with DCAC throughout the year. Um, so there's small, simple ways to get involved there. Always from awareness, an awareness perspective, just sharing our social media or telling a friend about us, um, about the work that we do. Um, we tell the community, if you see or hear about a child abuse case in the news, um, you can kind of guess that DCAC is responding to that case. Um, so maybe, you know, if that comes up, share with your friends about DCAC. And then, of course, I wouldn't be a good nonprofit employee if I didn't say donations. Um, so what we've really seen during this time is actually a increase in the number of donations, but at smaller dollar amounts. So mm -hmm. um, dollar amounts in the 25 to maybe $100, which added together are a big impact. Um, we had a case in the other day that was in the news, and I was asked to go buy lunch for one of the children that was being interviewed. Oh, wow. You know, and it was $9.08. If you donate $25, I mean, that could, you know, be a Wendy's vanilla frosty right. and a chicken sandwich meal for a kid that has to come in on what's likely the worst day of their life and mm. um you know maybe give them 
you know, just a little bit of comfort. So, and then $25, $25, you got 25 friends. That's a huge impact. So don't um, underestimate the impact that you can make through your philanthropy, no matter what dollar amount it's at. Mm, that's good. Yes, it, it does add up. And it's, it's going to take every day. It's going to take our whole community rally around to make sure we all get through this pandemic together. And on the other side of this in a safe and healthy manner. Um, yeah. So Sarah, what is y'all's website? And like, what are y'all's social media handles sure. so we can go follow so y'all? Our website is dcac.org. And all of our social media handles are Dallas CAC. So you can find us there. We're the multicolor pinwheel. Um, Dallas Children's Advocacy Center is a mouthful to say. So a lot of times you'll see us as DCAC. Um, but find us and get involved. And um, we'd love to learn more too from your listeners and you know how we can um, maybe educate the community more or um, partner in new and innovative ways. We love that. Mm. Well, thank you so much, Sarah, for your time and for the whole DCAC team, um, just how you're supporting children in our community before COVID-19 and during this time yes. and what you will be doing it afterwards. Your work has not and will not stop, unfortunately. Hopefully yes. one day, hopefully one day we can get there. Hopefully one day. Hopefully one day there's no more abuse. But yeah. until then, um, our community is so fortunate to have all the experts working on these cases. And of course, thank you to you and the Kleinert Foundation, um, and just your promoting um, and connecting agencies and leaders in this arena. We really appreciate it and appreciate your voice. It's so valuable. Mm. Well, you're so sweet. And I also want to shout out to our listeners right now. I know there is like we were talking about, there's so much content and I feel like I'm just being screamed out everywhere. So if you're listening right now, thank you so much for spending the last 30 something minutes with us. i um, just getting this message out there, learning more about DCAC. And so please consider supporting them. They are a critical organization in our community. Or if you're not in the Dallas area, there are children advocacy centers across our country. So please consider supporting them as well. Sarah, it's so lovely to see your face. Thank you. I miss you. I know. Hopefully, you know, we'll see you at another luncheon or at y'all's rescheduled Flower, luncheon. We'll see each other at Flower Child soon. Yes, yes. Okay. Well, everyone, thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Thank you for listening. Thank you for joining us on another episode of The Road to Innovation, powered by the Kleinert Foundation. If you'd like to learn more about today's social innovator, please visit kleinertfdn.org or the podcast website at theroadtoinnovation.com.